Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Can I remind members to put their mobile phones at least into a mode that don't interfere with proceedings? I'd be most grateful. Um, the first item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations on the withdrawal agreement that was published last week. Mr Russell was joined by two Scottish Government officials, Ian Mitchell, who is the Deputy Director of EU Strategy and Migration Division, and Alan Johnson, who is the Deputy Director of EU Exit Readiness. I will warmly welcome our witnesses to the meeting, and I will just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would like to make an opening statement. No, I, I think given the, the detail that we are going to have to go into today, I am very happy just to respond to, to questions. Clearly, I will be addressing uh, the issues that arise from the um, uh, attempt to secure a deal by the Prime Minister and what follows from that. Okay, okay, can I, I think we'll probably open up with a general discussion about the deal at a, at a higher level, and then we'll get into specifics and bits of it. But we also need to cover areas about legislative consent, etc. If any future with EU withdrawal, EU withdrawal agreement bill contains such issues. Um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, yesterday, even about in my own constituency, talking about with individuals and businesses, and I was up in the northern part of my constituency around Calendar, Calin area <laughs> yesterday, there's no question in my mind people are anxious, they're concerned about um, the situation that we're currently in, um, what the deal means for them, their families, uh, the, their security and their jobs. And businesses certainly are telling me that they're concerned about their planning for the future and it's beginning to hamper investment decisions because of the, the level of uncertainty. Um, and I, I'm no doubt that stalling of investment plans is probably having a drag in the economy. And the clear message I'm getting from people certainly is they just want all this uncertainty to end. But they're not sure at this stage if the deal the Prime Minister is um, prosecuting cuts it in terms of removing that uncertainty and therefore uh, there, that concern rem remains. <coughs> so just as a very general opening in, the, in these circumstances, Cabinet Secretary, what's the Scottish Government's view? Well, I entirely share the view of those who want this to come to an end. This has been an appalling period. Uh, it remains full of uncertainty and difficulty. Um, I, I noticed today there's a, a published study, I just say it in passing, uh, out today uh, from a, a group of uh, doctors in England that shows that prescribing of antidepressants rose immediately after the uh, a, um, a referendum. People are, feel terribly insecure and it's getting worse. But I have to say that uh, this would be, if you thought this was the moment at which you would feel better, this is a false dawn. This deal is not a deal that will do what those people and ourselves want, which is to provide certainty. Indeed, I'm, I will argue, I'm sure, during the course of this morning, this deal actually prolongs uncertainty. Um, and I would find it highly surprising if, for example, a transition period arising out of this deal uh, was concluded within the timescale being talked about the Prime Minister. I think even the timescale now being talked about by Monsieur Barney of the end of 2022 is ambitious in terms of the reality of the EU and how things will, will move. <coughs> I think we have to understand what this deal is. This deal arises because of the red lines that the Prime Minister set and has set over a two and a bit year period. There is a chart that illustrates this that, that was originally a slide from Task Force 50. It's reproduced all over the place. We reproduced it ourselves in one of the Scotland's Place in Europe papers. Uh, and that indicates that if you set red lines, then certain things will happen. And a red line that is set, for example, on uh, no jurisdiction of the ECJ will have certain consequences. A red line that is, is set on leaving the single market and, and walking away from the four freedoms will have certain consequences. Now, the trouble with that is those consequences arising from those red lines will be very damaging indeed, and particularly to Scotland, uh, particularly on the issue of freedom of movement, uh, the issue of uh, freedom of goods, capital and services, which are uh, the four freedoms, uh, on the ECJ issues and on other issues, there is a profound difficulty that will not be lessened by this. And the outcomes will be bad for Scotland in the short, medium and long term, and there will not be certainty. My own view and the view of the Scottish Government is that this is the moment in which we should work as hard as we can cross-party 
to ensure that this deal does not go through, to ensure that there is no no deal, because that can be done, and then get ourselves to the stage where we will have a better set of outcomes. And that's what we are trying to do. I was in London on Monday um, at a JMC, a deeply unsatisfactory JMC, uh, and then talking to others, and the First Minister was doing the same yesterday. And we will continue to do so, and indeed in this Parliament, I'm very keen to have those discussions, and uh, I will be having some of those between parties later this week. Forgive me for saying so, but, but how, real, how, how realistic is it at this stage that a, a, a new deal can emerge? It is very realistic indeed. There, there is an established procedure that we can follow. First of all, and fortunately the opposition parties at Westminster working together last week um, managed to secure a set of arrangements, which means that the meaningful vote can be amended. Uh, it is, in my view, first of all, essential to vote this deal down, but also for the House of Commons to indicate that there, there cannot be no deal. There is a procedure that would then allow 21 days for other proposals to be brought. Uh, the opposition parties are working with a sensible government, and it would be good to see that. The opposition parties working, hopefully, with government can devise other scenarios, and there's a range of scenarios. You could start with the sensible move of staying in the single market and the customs union uh, as an EEA option, and that's really a sensible thing to do. Uh, but there are other options, and we're neither ruling them in or out. You could have an election, you could have a people's vote, uh, and of course there will be discussions about other possibilities. What you, nobody should do is simply say it is this deal or nothing, because it isn't. Even the Prime Minister herself admitted that outside Downing Street last week, because she talked about no Brexit in those consequences, and that is also a possibility. So uh, if we were to find ourselves in a position of accepting this deal because we wanted this ordeal to be over, we would be making a profound mistake with really damaging consequences, not just for ourselves, but for those who come after us. <coughs> James Kelly. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just, just to be clear and kind of develop a bit in, in terms of what you've been discussing there, in relation to the implications of the vote that will take place at the House of Commons. I think it's quite clear at this point that that vote won't be successful and the, the, the deal in its current form wouldn't get through the House of Commons. So your view then is that post that, that there's this 21 day period and you would seek to explore options for changing the deal, but you would also look at the options of a general election and a people's vote. Yes, I mean, I think you might be able to come to an agreement before the meaningful vote as to uh, you know, what the next step would be, but the priority, and I've said this on Monday and I'll say it again now, the priority is to vote down this deal, uh, not to allow the damage to take place. But the range of options are as you indicate, and those would include a general election, a people's vote, a single market customs union membership, a range of other things. What we shouldn't be uh, dragooned into thinking is that either we accept the, the deal or chaos ensues. That is not the case. We shouldn't allow that to be the case, and it doesn't have to be the case. But working across party is now absolutely essential in this regard, uh, and I'm glad that work is underway. The First Minister met uh, Jeremy Corbyn and some of his colleagues yesterday, met uh, Vince Cable yesterday, met the leader of Plaid and the Greens yesterday, and those meetings will continue. Uh, do you think Article 50 would need to be extended, or do you think that post a deal been voted down by the House of Commons, there's still a possibility for a way forward to be worked out? Um, I, I, I think we should recognise that it is not about renegotiating this deal. You know, and in that regard, the EU are firm, and they, they're quite right to be firm. It's taken a long time to get to this, but this deal, as I said at the outcome, is driven by the red lines. Uh, and we have to walk, stop up that being driven by these red lines. I think the indications are also, if there is a material change, you know, in other words, the House of Commons votes this down, then the UK government should request uh, an extension of Article 50, which is, of course, in the text of Article 50 itself, that that is a possibility. Uh, and I think if there was a material change, my view is the EU would look at that sympathetically, because they wouldn't want this to descend into complete further chaos. Okay. Thank you. Um, Camino, I'm going to ask about um, the consequences of a, of a, of a no-deal Brexit, but bef before I do that, I just want to clarify something. Um, you've, you've been very negative about the draft withdrawal agreement. I assume that means that you've read it? When did I, you well, I have it here. I have, uh, you could say, skimmed it. I, was, I did note David Alan Green's um, uh, tweet yesterday, which I thought was very accurate. You know, it, it is probably only possible for anybody who is engaged in any other work to skim a document of this complexity, particularly if you're not a lawyer. If you are a lawyer, he said it would take you three days 
of solid study to understand it fully. I am not a lawyer and I haven't spent three days on it, but I am familiar with its contents. I'm also familiar with the contents of the uh, draft uh, political declaration as published, but I have not seen any of the developments of that which have clearly been taking place in the last 24 to 48 hours. But it is here. If you want to ask specific questions about it, we would have to go through it and, and find those things. It's not electronically indexed, but it is here and it is clearly of importance. Okay. I appreciate you're not a lawyer, Mr. Russell, but you will have in the employment of the Scottish Government, I dare say, many well-qualified and eminent lawyers who can assist you mm -hmm. on that. Can I ask you, therefore, when did you read the agreement? Uh, well, I read the agreement when it was uh, started to read it when it first came out and okay. continued to read it over the weekend, and it is here. But I am not a lawyer, and I'm not going to debate or discuss the fine print of this. We have lawyers in this room who are more than capable of, of doing so, and I'm sure want to do so. You indeed are a lawyer. Um, what I'm, I'm familiar with is both what is in here in the draft political declaration and also I am familiar with the uh, recommendations and information that's come to me, as okay. you say, okay. from distinguished lawyers. Okay. And, uh, but but you, you, you skimmed the document and you formed a view in it when it was published. I'm just wondering how you were able to do that, because the document went in the public domain at 11.46 a.m. last Wednesday, and at 12.09 p.m., 23 minutes later, you tweeted the following. This is a very poor and disastrous deal. Mm -hmm. How much of the document had you read? Well, you see, what you're endeavouring to, well, to do is to say that I came to this document uh, unwilling to accept in, that I would accept it. And, <laughs> and, indeed, and the evidence would suggest well, that is well, the case. Well, I came to this document on the basis, as I've said, uh, Mr. Fraser, and I think it's very clear, if you have an agreement based upon a set of red lines, which will be very damaging to Scotland, which this document is, then you cannot have an agreement that is going to be good for Scotland. Now, I have to say, had I proved to be wrong in that, you know, I would have admitted to be wrong. I am not wrong. And neither is the opinion of all of those who have looked at it and said to themselves, this will be a disastrous deal for Scotland. And as a representative of a Scottish constituency and a member of the Scottish Parliament and a minister, my view is that this is very bad for Scotland. Okay. I would hope that all those who are responsible to their constituents in Scotland would come to the same okay. factual conclusion. Okay, so, so we established you made up your mind before you even saw the text of the document that it was a bad deal and you weren't going to like it. So we've established that, thank you. Can I ask, therefore, um, we hear a lot of concern about the prospect of a no-deal Brexit. We've heard that from a whole range of industry sectors and a whole range of those, uh, indeed, across, across the public sector and, and, indeed, the public about a no-deal. Um, is this better than a no-deal? Or worse? Uh, it is, a no deal would be worse than this. Right. Okay. So when it comes to a choice between this and a no deal, this is better. When it comes to and choice... You, and you would support Well, it. no. When it comes to choice between this or alien invasion, this is better. <laughs> uh, but the reality of the situation is both are very bad. We could go into semantics and discuss what that means in terms we, we, of comparison. But alien invasion is but the reality, less likely than a no deal. Oh, I don't know. Have you seen Jacob rees <laughs> Really? Mm. Come on. Mm. Oh, yeah, okay, let, 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 me, let me make one more question. Let's try, let's, try and, let's try and elevate this discussion that we can, Cabinet Secretary, okay, and not get personal about it. Um, can, what... Um, sorry, Commissioner? One would go. Sorry? Please continue. Okay. Um, we've, we've heard in the last few days calls from the Confederation of British Industry calls from the National Farmers Unions across the United Kingdom, including in Scotland, urging support for the Prime Minister's deal. Shouldn't you be listening to them? I, I am not only listening to them, Mr Fraser, I'm engaging with them. And I'm engaging with them on the basis that I've indicated to you that I fully understand the position that they're taking. They have been treated abominably by the current Conservative government for the last two and a half years. They quite clearly want the agony to end, and I fully understand that. But I also think that a measured approach to this I would say two things. One is this is very bad and will continue to create uncertainty and damage in the long term, and therefore it's important that that is recognised. And secondly, I want to counter the false propaganda that it is only this deal or no deal. That is not true. And therefore it is an obligation upon me to say it isn't true and therefore to talk about what can be done. And that's precisely what I'm doing and I'm going to go on doing. Okay, thank you. Tom, you've got a quick supplementary. 
Yeah, good morning. I just wonder, Mr. Russell, if, like myself, you took the liberty of reading the draft withdrawal agreement as published on 19th of March, therefore vitiating the need to go and read through the entire withdrawal agreement as published last week, allowing you to focus on the key matters which weren't published in March. Well, I think that's a very good point, and this, uh, this is not, doesn't come as an enormous surprise. You know, I would have hoped that the Prime Minister could have done better, but I just go back to this really important point. <coughs> What is in this arises out of the red lines. And, you know, the Barnier slide is of great importance in this. And we saw that slide, oh, I don't know, 18 months ago, uh, certainly a year ago. And what the slide tells you is if you set these red lines, this is what's going to happen. These are the outcomes. Now, the Prime Minister set these red lines in an attempt to balance the forces in her warring party. Those red lines have resulted in this bad situation. It's not a surprise. You know, nobody came to this tabula rasa. Uh, they came to it knowing what had taken place. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Patrick, you had a, a, in the generality, I know you've got other questions around the GM, the, the committee process, but you want to talk about the generality at this stage? Um, well, I, I think the, the, the questions I wanted to ask about the Joint Committee are, are, are relevant to the discussions about initial reactions okay. that, that just came up. Um, you, you're right, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the... Um, there's no electronic index. It's not a, a very well-presented document in terms of making it easy to, to understand. Uh, but it did take me about five minutes with the Control-F function on my computer just to find that there is no mm. mechanism included for the, the, the clear input of either the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, or, or other devolved administrations. The joint committee that's set up under Article 164 between the UK and the EU... Uh, which will be really pretty crucial in trying to smooth out any conflicts that arise if this agreement is actually put in place, so all on the assumption that it's been passed by Westminster and uh, put into law. That joint committee, has there been any discussion between the Scottish Government and the UK Government about how that's supposed to operate and the means by which there'd be input? Because in the absence of Scottish MEPs, it seems to me this is the only route in to the discussions about mm -hmm. how to implement and how to continue to negotiate uh, either the, the transition period or the longer term future? Uh, there has been no such discussion, but the, the, the precedent in this is worrying. Um, there was a discussion at GMC, uh, I think last week, <coughs> led by Suella Braverman, uh, yet another one who isn't there now, uh, and led well, I have to say. I thought she was an effective minister in terms of taking her brief forward. Um, uh, about the Independent Monitoring Authority on the uh, Withdrawal Agreement Bill. And both Mark Drakeford in Wales and myself made the point that we expected to see and, and thought we had to see uh, a representative of Scotland on that. What we were getting back was what you know, often you get back in these discussions. This isn't going to be representational. This is going to be based on merit. Uh, you know, and I did make the point that I thought there would be at least one person who was meritorious enough in Scotland and one person meritorious enough in Wales to serve upon it. Exactly the same, of course, with the Trade Remedy Authority. No uh, membership, despite the fact that this was pursued in the House of Commons. So, in my view, the, um, the Joint Committee will not presumably contain that balance which it should contain. Now, I'd be want, want to see that if this were to come to pass. I would want to make sure that Scotland was in there but the precedent isn't good. There, there is a, a provision that says that this joint committee will make its decisions by mutual agreement. Um, either, it, seem, it seems to me, either there's a, a, an opportunity to ensure that the UK on this joint committee is represented uh, by all ministers who have an interest in, in matters under discussion. So if there's a devolved matter, the devolved administrations would be physically present on that committee. Uh, or that um, the positions of the UK uh, on that committee are those reached by mutual agreement in the, the UK's internal JMC mechanism. Yeah. Do you have a view about what would be the, the best way of doing this? I mean, I'd personally be happy to, to see this deal struck down, but yeah. it is theoretically possible mm. that it will be implemented mm. and we'll be living with these, these provisions. Yeah. How should it work? Uh, well, and... and, and what, e what efforts are you making to 
to uh, change the thinking of the UK about how it's going to work. Can I roll that question back just a step? Uh, whatever arrangements are come to, we'll need to recognise both the existence of devolution and the fact that devolution is badly broken as a mm. result of Brexit. So this is tied up with the issue of what happens next in terms of the involvement of, of the devolved administrations. Um, it would seem to me uh, that the poor understanding of devolution exists in the UK government at the present moment fails to understand that there are no hierarchy, there's no hierarchy of governments. There's a hierarchy of parliaments, there's no hierarchy of governments. So there are responsibilities for each government. Now, that's not to say that the UK government can't overrule the Scottish government. Of course it can, but by using the parliament, parliamentary route, it is that hierarchy of parliaments. So it would seem to me that the important thing is to recognise the need to ensure that where there is a devolved responsibility, then the minister with that responsibility is the one involved in this process. And that leads you to the assumption that some sort of mechanism, such as the Carwin Jones has, has talked about frequently, of having some sort of council of ministers of these islands that uh, sit as equals, uh, <coughs> dealing with issues which, for example, the UK government will deal with for England, Welsh ministers will deal with, Scottish ministers will deal with, and when they exist, Northern Ireland ministers would deal with, would be the right way forward. That would mean that in your, uh, I, 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 what you're postulating, the involvement of those ministers as equals within that process would be the right thing to do. Now, that deciding upon that should be part of the process of looking at the failures of devolution to cope with the present situation and changing it accordingly. Thank you. Now, you, you yourself just raised, um, Cabinet Secretary, issues of involvement of devolved institutions, and I think we should go there now around issues of consent. Adam. Thank you, Convener. Before I ask you questions of um, consent, um, Cabinet Secretary, I'm not sure I have you, your, your attention yet. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Are you ready? Good. I am, of course, ready. Um, before I go into questions of consent, Cabinet Secretary, the presiding officer of this Parliament has many times reminded us all that in these debates we should treat other parliamentarians in parliaments across this country with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And I have my quarrels with Jacob Rees-Mogg too, but describing him in the context of an alien invasion is a remark which I know it was a rush of blood to the head, Cabinet Secretary, but frankly was beneath you. Would you like to withdraw it? No, my, my blood didn't rush to my head, but if the joke misfired in any sense, then of course I'm sorry yeah. about that. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm sure Mr Rees-Mogg will appreciate the apology. Um, certainly I do. A legislative consent, Cabinet Secretary, is it still the um, Scottish Government's position um, that the uh, Scottish Government will not participate in any legislative consent process with regard to any Brexit legislation? Yes. Um, so this presumably includes any future legislation about the, with regard to the withdrawal agreement? It does. Thank you. Um, does it also um, extend to le the legislative consent process which is underway with regard to the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill? It may not um, extend to that. Uh, that is a matter that we have to fully discuss uh, with the relevant ministers. Who is the relevant minister? Uh, it would be Jean Freeman, I would think. Okay. But, that, but the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill is Brexit-related yes, Brexit uh, legislation, is it, it not? It, it is, and I don't want to give a hard and fast answer on the Healthcare Arrangements Bill because it does cover a significant number of individuals who will require um, services. And in those circumstances, I don't want to give that uh, at this present moment because I want to discuss it with the relevant minister. Okay, so um, as I understand it, um, Cabinet Secretary, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill gives the Secretary of State powers to fund and arrange healthcare for British citizens living in the EU27 mm -hmm. after we leave the European Union. And among other matters, it will help nearly 200,000 British pensioners, including Scottish pensioners, of course, living in EU countries, to continue to access the healthcare that they need. And it will mean that hundreds of thousands of British citizens, including people who live and work in Scotland, who require medical treatment each year during holidays in Europe, can still be covered for medical assistance when they need it. Um, and this is, as we have agreed, Brexit-related Brexit related legislation and is um, therefore legislation that you have said and you just reconfirmed that you wish to have no part of the legislative consent process with regard to any Brexit-related legislation. Now, as I understand it, Cabinet Secretary, um, Scottish pensioners living abroad would continue to have their health care paid because the UK government would legislate for that anyway, even if your consent or indeed Holyrood's consent is not forthcoming. But there are categories of people that the bill cannot cover in Scotland unless there is a legislative consent memorandum and indeed a legislative consent motion passed. 
so that, for example, present arrangements that enable patients in the United Kingdom to be treated by the NHS, sorry, being treated by the NHS to travel to an EU country for treatment if required, uh, would no longer be possible for NHS patients in Scotland. Is it really the Scottish Government's view um, that the devolution process is so broken because of Brexit that these patients should be harmed in this way? Well, let me repeat the answer I gave to you before you, gave, you asked that question. I will have discussions with the relevant minister because I recognise the sensitivity of this and that is our position. So if you are arguing I'm taking a hard and fast view on that bill, I am not. So it's no longer the case that the Scottish Government will not <laughs> participate in the legislative consent process for all Brexit-related legislation? Perhaps I could just say, would you rather I had a hard and fast view that did what you wanted me to do clearly, which is to deprive people of the services, or would you rather that I took a pragmatic, sensitive and sensible view, which is what I am taking? I would rather that you were accurate in your answers to questions that are asked in good faith by this committee. And the question is, is it the Scottish Government's position that the Scottish Government will have nothing to do with the legislative consent process with regard to any Brexit-related legislation. It is the Scottish Government's position that I will consider uh, on their merits, as the Cabinet will, uh, issues that arise, including issues that are of great sensitivity. That is what you would expect a government to do. So having thrown all your toys out the pram, you're now having to get them back in the pram, aren't you? Uh, convener, I, I think there was a question about respect uh, at the start of uh, this that seems to have disappeared. I understand this is an emotional matter um, and I just ask everyone involved in, this, in these discussions from to try to recognise we're trying to do a job as best as we can in as civil a way as we can regardless who we are around the, this table I think that would be, that would be helpful um, I think that takes us to well actually let me ask a question first of all about legislative consent issues because um, if the withdrawal agreement is voted on by the, the, the UK Parliament um, that, may, that will require domestic legislation in the UK. And has there been any discussions with the United Kingdom government uh, about the areas of the bill which may um, require legislative consent of the Scottish Parliament? Yes, there have been uh, in terms of the withdrawal implementation bill. <coughs> I, I said earlier, and I want to say again, uh, Suella Braverman, who was handling this for UK government through JMC, was doing extremely well. Uh, and was doing it in a very positive and constructive way. And both Mark Drake and I indicated at the meeting on, on Tuesday, we will, on Monday, we will miss her uh, because she was consulting, she was bringing material to us. That doesn't alter the fact that we do not believe that we should give legislative consent, given that the legislative consent process is broken and was clearly broken in the way the UK government behaved earlier this year. Um, but there are areas in the bill that will require legislative consent. Uh, we, are, we have negotiated and discussed details of the bill and will continue to do so. We could resolve the issue of legislative consent very quickly. I have put uh, uh, proposals, as people on this table know, to David Liddington, which would resolve this instantly. Uh, and I had another conversation with him about them last week. Regrettably, the UK government have not brought those forward and have not agreed them. When they agree them, if they agree them, then we can move into a, a situation which will allow us to operate in as constructive a way as possible by having profound disagreements about what the, the issues are. Profound disagreements, I have to say, undertaken in a civilised and sometimes jocular way, uh, as it should be. Okay, um, we move into some of the specifics now. Um, Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Hi. Secretary. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in issues around fishing and the common fisheries policy as we move forward. There's been some... Uh, in, interesting info in the in our briefing that the draft withdrawal agreement contains provisions related to fisheries with transition, future relationship and the potential use of the backstop. And I'm aware that concerns have been raised about the issue of backstop and uh, access to waters and access to markets. And I don't know if I fully understand it. I wondered if you could tell me how do we plan to have access to our waters with the Scottish fishermen as we move forward? Well, I, I, you know, I think this agreement uh, indicates that that's not likely to happen in the way that the Scottish fishermen have been promised, repeatedly promised by the Conservative Party at every level, that it would happen. And this won't be a surprise to observers of this over the last 40 to 45 years, because the story of the last 40 to 45 years is, is a constant disappointment. Uh, from the UK government, UK governments uh, to Scottish fishermen in terms of what they've been promised and what is actually delivered. Uh, this uh, deal indicates uh, that uh, there will, there could be at some stage, uh, a, the status of a coastal state. 
What it also indicates is that there are already discussions underway about trading off access uh, for um, other issues. It also does so <coughs> with one new element, which is very concerning. Suddenly, out of nowhere, aquaculture appears uh, yeah. in this matter. Aquaculture is actually worth more to the Scottish economy uh, than the, the, the other parts of the fishing industry. It appears to have been thrown in here as something to be traded off. I, I heard at the weekend from uh, somebody I know who is a senior journalist in Norway um, who says that the Norwegian aquaculture industry are thrilled by this because they think it will diminish the competitiveness of the Scottish aquaculture industry. Um, so I think we're seeing something very cynical in this, cynical in terms of promises to the Scottish fishermen, and cynical and damaging in terms of uh, the aquaculture industry. Um, and the final point I would give to you on this is, if transition is <coughs> longer than presently stated, and it will be, I mean, there is a European election in, 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 in June next year. It will be October at least, and possibly the end of the year before a new commission is in place that will leave a single year for the complex negotiations, which are far more complex than what has happened up until now. So let us assume that transition will take considerably longer. That means we could be at 2022, 2023, before there's any resolution of this, again, contrary to the promises that have been made. So I think we should be very straight about this. The Prime Minister's so-called deal in here uh, doesn't even honour the commitments to the one sector, I have to say, <coughs> that she talks about in the Scottish economy. She never talks about any other sector in the Scottish economy but she talks about fishing because she thinks she's got support there. That support might be eroding faster than she expects, given the nature of this deal. Just a quick sup. Um, Secretary of State David Mundell said he was content with the fishing deal, and he used that one word, content. Mm. But, I mean, I would be more inclined to use the words continued uncertainty or, or you know, potential sellout again. Is that something that we should be... Like alerting the, the fishermen about? Well, if, if fishing was a red line for the Secretary of State for Scotland and, and the status of Northern Ireland, then I don't really quite understand why he hasn't recognised that, but that's a matter for him. Okay, thank you. Alex, you've got questions on agriculture. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I note my register of interest around agriculture? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you say everyone shared your immediate rejection of withdrawal agreement, uh, but uh, NFU Scotland, in a joint statement, uh, said that whilst the draft Brexit withdrawal agreement, whilst not perfect, was an opportunity that needs to be taken. Yeah, were they wrong? Um, I didn't say that everyone immediately rejected the draft withdrawal agreement. Uh, what I said was that I believe that uh, I have the greatest understanding and sympathy for those who want to get this agony over, an agony imposed by the Conservatives. Uh, but I do think it will turn out to be uh, a disappointment to them, uh, a point I have already made to the NFU and will continue to make to them on the basis of the analysis that I have given you and, and further information. We will publish more information uh, over the next few days that will indicate what, is the, what the real problems are within this. Thank you. Angela. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to the, the panel. Um, before I ask some questions around um, EU citizens and migration, um, the Cabinet Secretary knows me uh, well, and he knows that I just like to cut to the chase. <laughs> um, and it seems to me, and I'm sure he'll correct me if I'm uh, wrong, but it seems to me that uh, England and Wales uh, get what they've voted for. Uh, Remain voting Northern Ireland uh, is getting a special arrangement to stay close to the EU, uh, and uh, rightly so, and for good reasons. Yet Scotland, with the uh, highest vote to remain in the UK, has, in my view, uh, been ignored. And that leads me to ask the question uh, in less than the 23 minutes uh, referred to by Mr Fraser. How come everybody else gets what they voted for? And given that they say that past behaviour is the best predictor of future behaviour, and we know that the LCM process has been trashed, uh, we have heard countless accounts how the joint ministerial committees um, have been frustrating. There's no membership for Scotland on the uh, joint committees. Uh, how confident are you that the UK government is going to start treating this parliament and the people of Scotland with the dignity, fairness and respect that they demand and deserve? I am very familiar with your direct uh, approach. I'll give you a direct answer. I have no such confidence at all. I think, that, as you say, and you're well qualified as a, a, a former professional and, and social worker in this to say past behaviour is often an indicator. I see no change coming at all. I would only add one thing. Uh, it's not just all those things areas that have got what they asked for, 
Gibraltar, of course, got what they expected, and I'm very glad about that. I, I rejoice that Gibraltar and Northern Ireland have got arrangements which suit them. Um, I understand, of course, in Wales, for example, the, the vote was very likely now against uh, leaving, but they did originally vote by a small majority to, to, to leave. Scotland has been uniquely disadvantaged and remains uniquely disadvantaged. Now, you would think, you know, given that the governing party at Westminster has 13 Scottish MPs, they would be leaping up and down and demanding a better treatment for Scotland. The opposite is the case. They're actually demanding that Scotland is treated as badly as everybody else. I, I do think that's a bit weird. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, thank you. Um, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary has seen the, the BBC reports of Mrs May's remarks yesterday to the, the, mm. the, the CBI, where she uh, has uh, vowed uh, to put a stop to EU nationals jumping the queue. She didn't, of course, set out any details how she proposes to do that. So it would again seem to me that the Tories uh, are once again appealing to the lowest common denominator, a theme through this whole uh, Brexit debate that uh, has its roots back to the referendum. But I wondered what is your reaction, uh, given that there is a, a positive case, an economic case for uh, migration and the importance of freedom of movement uh, and the facts that we know the EU nationals are also net contributors? It was a substantive item of discussion at the GMC. Uh, in fact, has been several times migration, but on Monday there was a very, very strong view put both by myself and Mark Drakeford that we found this totally unacceptable. And indeed, I went so far in the television interviews afterwards to say that I specifically disassociated the Scottish Government from those remarks. They are disgraceful. Uh, they are, in my view, dog whistle politics. They are designed to uh, play to the lowest common denominator. And they're also wrong. They're wrong, both morally wrong, but they're wrong in the practicalities of the situation. Uh, migration is a, a benefit to Scotland. As you say, it's a net benefit in terms of the, the, the earning potential and, 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 and contribution of uh, migrants. But they're an essential in terms of Scotland and Scotland's economic health. I mean, I say again and again that in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, 20% of the working age population will retire within the next five to ten years. The people are not reproducing themselves. There's no net there's no growth in the Highland population unless it comes from migration. If you do what is proposed, actually this Prime Minister's uh, deal proposes, then you will condemn the Highlands of Islands of Scotland to perpetual long-term labour shortages in key sectors. I met with the lead tourism provider in, in my constituency uh, some weeks ago who told me that on the sites that they, they manage, they have been between 10 and 15% down in workforce for the last mm -hmm. year that they are now paying cleaning staff up to £12 an hour because they, they have to compete uh, because there's a real shortage of staff. Uh, and that is kicking in uh, it progressively every year. And it's not just in tourism. It's every part uh, of the labour force. This is self-defeating, but the language of it is wrong too. The mm -hmm. language is driving people away. Mm -hmm. And it's utterly the wrong thing to do. Uh, and you know, we, we will have nothing to do with it. And nobody in this country should have anything to do with it because it's against our own interests to argue in this way. Okay. Um, and I'm sure Mr Russell is also aware that um, this committee has um, acknowledged and indeed uh, opined on the financial risks uh, associated uh, to our budget with the, the, democratic, the, sorry, the uh, demographic challenge uh, facing Scotland. We know that over the next 25 years, the uh, pensioner age population will increase by 25%, and yet there's a predicted contraction in the working age population. We know that Scotland, in comparison to the rest of the uh, UK, that the uh, impact um, of migration on our uh, GDP is you know, potentially uh, greater. So I wondered, what, what certainty does the proposed uh, withdrawal agreement uh, give to Scotland that you know, our particular needs um, are going to be met? Well, um, you know, we, put, we gave very comprehensive evidence to the MAC study. We were immensely disappointed with it. So were Wales, so were Northern Ireland. There was a complete inability to understand the economies of Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. It was incredibly uh, Anglo-centric. Um, and you know, this has continued because the UK government is leaning upon this false analysis in order to drive forward a policy of, that will do huge damage. I mean, I, I have to say I really laboured the point on Monday in London. 
You know, they, they have to recognise, the UK government has to recognise. This is not, as, as one of the previous immigration ministers said, oh, well, the same sort of difficulty as we have in a shortage of construction workers. This is existential for Scotland. Uh, you know, the population, if the population declines in the way that it looks, it may, may decline in the scenario of zero EU migration, the population would decline by 3% by 2041. Uh, in those circumstances, that will be particularly concentrated in rural areas and particularly in the west of Scotland. So I speak with some passion about this because of my own constituency. Uh, that type of depopulation drives down the availability of services, is circular, you have, it, it feeds upon itself, um, and it leads to whole communities essentially declining, dying, and being emptied. And, and that's the reality. And that's the, what Scotland is being condemned to by a government in London that is not listening. And that's why I feel particularly strongly about it, because I really want to take those people I want to take Caroline Lucas, the immigration minister, to you know, the, the, the islands of Argyll and point out to her the consequences of the actions which she appears to wish to take will lead to the decline and actually emptying of those communities. And that's the reality. And that's what they need to know. And surely in those circumstances, if they saw it with their own eyes, they would desist from their destructive actions. Okay, thank you, Convener. Neil. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> I want to ask you about uh, the effect the withdrawal agreement will have on ongoing discussions about common UK frameworks. Um, do you accept there is now a greater urgency in agreeing those frameworks in the possible event of a hard Brexit? And what impact will the Northern Ireland Protocol within the withdrawal agreement have on the negotiation of common UK frameworks and the operation of the UK internal market? Two, two, two related questions. On frameworks, we have tried very hard over the last two years of the um, uh, JMC, and, and astonishingly the 15th meeting was held uh, uh, this week, we have tried very hard to see if we could get a modus operandi through the frameworks that at least allowed uh, some uh, activity and, and, and work together to take place. And we've been quite successful, I have to say, because of a determination by those of us to do so and because of superb work by officials. So I'm not intending to see to threaten the work of the frameworks in any way. We are continuing to make progress. There's a lot of stuff in there and operating. I said, I think, at a previous meeting of this committee, the real problem with frameworks, I think I actually said it at the event that the, the committee held in the RSE, is the more you have to write them down, the less easy it is to, to get agreement. You know, if they operate on the basis of mutual cooperation, if they operate on the basis of established relationships, they can tend to work quite well. When you get to something like the Agriculture Bill, when you're trying to make it very specific, you do have a problem because there will clearly be issues of, of difficulty in agreement. But even then, discussion, even in that instance, discussion is continuing. So I hope we can continue work on frameworks, though you know, the, the relationship is poor, and I have to say that there's a complete lack of trust, I think, on both sides. Uh, and we are also in a situation where we profoundly disagree with what is now taking place. In terms of the Northern Irish situation, the conundrum of that, that that presents, presents an additional issue to frameworks. And the conundrum is this. If you are trying to engage each the four countries of these islands to work together in the framework, but one of those is in actual fact in regulatory alignment with an EU country, which will be the case, uh, in terms of the Northern Ireland situation, then there are difficulties in managing that. We pointed that out at the very beginning. It has not been addressed by the UK. I think we will begin to see it. <coughs> now, of course, if, you were, if there was another one, if we were also in that situation, then the benefits might accrue to the other members who weren't. But at the present moment, it's not clear that how that will happen with simply one of us and operating in a different way and perhaps in a different market. Finally, there is nothing... Uh, that prevents, in, as far as we understand it, with, within the agreement that would prevent Northern Ireland fully accessing the UK market. Uh, contrary to what uh, I noticed Sammy Wilson was saying the other day, there isn't anything that would prevent, prevent that. So in those circumstances, the operation of the so-called UK uh, internal market would presumably continue. The UK internal market must be predicated upon the understanding of devolution and the, the, the legal reality of devolution that exists. And some of the way in which the UK internal market is being talked about seems to ignore the reality of devolution and subsidiarity. And we will resist any changes that push us in that direction. Thanks. Willie, I have questions in this area as well. 
Thanks very much, Bruce. The uh, Cabinet Secretary, Robert, the Secretary of State last month said that he couldn't support a differentiated deal, differentiated deal for Northern Ireland. Now we've got one, now he appears to support it. Could you give us your view about what the, the difficulties that Scottish producers will face if this deal goes ahead in this manner? Well, they are legion. Um, if you have you know, a very close neighbour here who uh, essentially which can access the single market in a way that we can't, um, you, know, you will, on the very crudest level, be competing with one hand tied behind your back. If you are an incoming investor and you want to access the single market, you'll base yourself in Northern Ireland, not in Scotland. Uh, you will be able to have preferential treatment in terms of your goods uh, and how they move, including services, of course, uh, which will not be available to Scotland. So it will be an additional element of competition uh, which will be difficult to deal with. Um, you know, it will also mean that there, those who manufacture in Northern Ireland, whether it be food, drink, agri-food is very important to Northern Ireland, a range of other things, will be operating with full European standards in perpetuity because that's what the backstop is about. Whereas, you know, we will be at the, uh, at the mercy of a UK government which may be increasingly driven towards coming to trade deals with people whose standards are not the same standards as the European standards. Uh, and in those circumstances, that will also lead to a de deterioration of our ability to compete effectively in the markets we should be competing in. So it's simply, it's a wrong thing to happen. Now, you know, th this is driven by uh, a UK government uh, that, that doesn't want to give anything to Scotland. I mean, that's at the centre of their thinking. We saw the, we saw the, 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 the uh, reports that in uh, their discussions on the Northern Ireland backstop in Brussels, they were desperate to ensure that any drafting uh, excluded any possibility of Scotland being involved. Uh, there is a dog-in-the-manger attitude towards Scotland, which simply cannot be overcome as far as I can see it. So in those circumstances, you know, this exclusion will be damaging, and they know it will be damaging. So why the Secretary of State for Scotland doesn't see it be damaging, I have no idea. Maybe it's reading a different document. Mm. I mean, as we move forward from this, and if this deal is, is rejected by the House of Commons, how do we move forward from that to try to get at least the same kind of arrangement for Northern Ireland, for Scotland too, in some future discussion beyond this deal being trashed, basically? We very much recognise what Northern Ireland needs. You know, and we have no difficulty with that at all. We support it very strongly. Uh, you know, we're not resisting it in any way. Indeed, were Scotland to be offered what Northern Ireland is offered, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here doing criticising the withdrawal agreement. Uh, you know, I would say I still want to stay in the EU because I do want to stay uh, in the EU. But you know, that deal would be a deal which we could certainly negotiate seriously upon. Um, as far back as uh, Scotland's place in Europe, which we published in December 2016. We indicated why single market membership was of vital importance to Scotland. We indicated that we would prefer the whole of the UK to stay in the single market, but if that didn't happen, then we would want to see a Scotland staying in the single market, a differentiated deal. David Davis told me to my face in his office in, in the House of Commons in January 2017 that was, in his words, impossible. It could not be done. Right? Now we see it not only could be done, but is going to be done. So, you know, that is, that is uh, you know, particularly galling. Scotland's place in Europe also indicated that to make it really effective, then you would move on and strengthen the devolution package. It gives, for example, legal personality uh, to, to, to Scotland. It allowed Scotland to take part, as the subsidiary parliaments do in Belgium, in, in trade discussions and negotiations. So you get a strong package out of it. Scotland's had nothing out of it. Any support for Scotland's position, do you think, in the House of Commons opposition parties on this issue? About well, I think you'd have to ask the House of Commons opposition parties. I noticed that Jeremy Corbyn referred on, I think, last week in response to the Prime Minister in her statement, talked about the issue of uh, uh, the migration and, and, and devolution. And I think that was an important contribution that he made. So clearly there's an understanding. Now, it you know, may not be and probably isn't exactly the same as I'm expressing it, but I think there is an understanding that these are live issues. You know, and, and you know, basic Democrats um, would look at this and say, hang on a minute. I mean, in the point that Angela Constance made, you know, if Scotland voted 62% to, to, to remain, um, surely in a mature political system, there would have been a sensible negotiation that would have recognised that and allowed for that within the overall polity that the EU, UK government was pursuing. There has been no recognition of it at all. Thank you. And we want to ask about digital, perhaps, Willie. We'll come back to that, though, because I've still got other supplementaries in this area. Patrick. 
Thanks very much. I just wanted to come back on the, the issues relating to the arrangements in the withdrawal agreement for Northern Ireland or to prevent a, a hard border um, and the relationship to, to the, the, the later discussion on, on frameworks because we, we talk about frameworks almost in a sort of technocratic sense that it's a, a merely operational or, or administrative arrangement to allow uh, separate policy to, to exist and, and some shared decisions to, 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 to bind them together. Um, if, if, if frameworks are, are this technocratic arrangement, they should be ideologically neutral. Um, it seems to me that the level playing field commitments in the, uh, in the Northern Ireland backstop place a great deal of emphasis on things that restrict the ability of governments to make decisions, like state aid, and very little emphasis uh, on things that restrict the operation of the private sector, like environmental regulations or workplace protections. So it seems to me that this is a, an ideologically loaded framework, if you like. Uh, is, there a, is there a danger, not only that that has a, an impact on Northern Ireland, but that that is the tone of the discussion on common frameworks in future, uh, that we don't see something which merely facilitates good government, but something which... Um, is ideologically loaded in favour uh, of, the, of the kind of politics that some on the hard right of the Conservative Party, uh, whatever their planetary origin, uh, would like to see imposed on us. I'm not going to rise to that one particularly, but I have to say that the hard right, of course, is driving this debate, uh, and Brexit is a hard right policy. You know, and um, uh, the rest of the Conservative Party, even in <coughs> Scotland, have simply gone along with it, presumably for fear of the Conservatives not being in office. I, I think the point you raise is a an important one. Uh, my position has been, and I think it's been the position of others who've been negotiating this, to see frameworks as a scaffolding you know, uh, <coughs> around the building and to make sure the scaffolding's there and can be used. The actual agreements lie within the building itself, within each of the subjects uh, that we're dealing with. And, of course, on those, that the policy differences become important. Uh, if there is freedom to operate in those key policy areas, that's fine. But in some reserved areas, there will be no such freedom to operate. And in those areas, then, the type of push you're talking about is taking place. Um, that is why it is very important that this parliament is the master of all the issues rather than merely some of them, so that we don't uh, find ourselves in that position. Thank you. No, I don't. Um, I wanted to ask a slightly different question, but uh, this is, I wanted to ask a, a supplementary to Willie Coffey's question, but I now have a supplementary to Patrick Harvey's supplementary to Willie Coffey's question, which um, the convener and I were just talking about as you were um, un answering it, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, it is the case, isn't it, that there are included um, within Annex 5, which is the very long list of single market provisions that will continue to apply in Northern Ireland, but not in the rest of the United Kingdom in the event that the protocol comes into force. Um, in, with, included within that list are quite a number of environmental regulations and directives. So it's not the case that, the, as Mr Harvey may have implied, that all, all of the single market rules and regulations which will apply in Northern Ireland are restrictions on government. Some of them are, are quite a lot of them actually are about product standardisation, product safety, uh, environmental standards, uh, and so on and so forth. That's, I'm, yeah, they won't apply in Scotland. No, but the, the, the argument that Mr Harvey was, well, the, was, the question which Mr Harvey put to you was about whether the um, uh, construction of the single market protections which we have in the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol in backstop is ideologically driven in favour of a, um, a, a particular you know, pro-business um, uh, direction. I don't think that's an no. accurate... I don't think that would be an accurate reflection of the complexity of what's in Annex 5. I think it would might be... I mean, let's not fall out about this because this is an interpretation of a question, but it seems to me that the ideological drive, insofar as it affects Scotland... Uh, will be and could be profound. Okay. All right. I wanted to ask you a slightly different question, um, uh, but re very closely related to the, to the issue that you were exploring with Mr Coffey. And that is um, this. The, what is, one of the things which is remarkable about the backstop, um, uh, as it's informally called, I, I prefer to call it the protocol because I have the misfortune of being a lawyer and I've read this document, one of the things which is remarkable about, about the protocol is that the European Union has accepted something which at the beginning of this process it said it wouldn't accept, which is the disaggregation of the four fundamental freedoms of the single market. Um, and what Article 6.2 of the protocol would maintain for Northern Ireland 
um, uh, in the event that the protocol comes into force, are a series of single market provisions, a long series of single market provisions with regard to goods, not with regard to free movement of workers or people, not with regard to free movement of services, not with regard to free movement of capital, but with regard to free movement of goods. And the European Union has accepted this because, as I hope we all agree, it is imperative that um, Brexit does not jeopardise North-South cooperation on the island of Ireland, that Brexit does not trigger a hard border on the island of Ireland, uh, and that Brexit does not undermine in any way any aspect of the Belfast Agreement of 1998. And I think on all of that, I think there is agreement between all of us. Certainly, Mr Russell, there's agreement between you and, and me. Now, the Scottish Government want those um, uh, provisions that apply with regard to Northern Ireland also to apply to Scotland, so that, in the words of the First Minister last week, there is no competitive disadvantage to businesses in Scotland. So my question is this. Um, what evidence do you have um, that the European Union would be prepared to accept that these extraordinary provisions, which apply in these extraordinary circumstances because of the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland, would, you know, could be extended also to other parts of the United Kingdom, whether Scotland or whether the whole of the United Kingdom, given that they do fly in the face of what was one of the European Union's red lines at the beginning of the process, namely that the four fundamental freedoms of the single market could not be disaggregated. So, it would, in other words, you know, would the European Union accept that the extraordinary provisions of Article 6.2 of the, of the Northern Ireland Protocol could be extended to other parts of the United Kingdom? It's a good question. Um, I think the response to it should be in two parts, if you don't mind. The first part is to consider the whole of the UK, and the second part is to consider Scotland. Okay. In terms of the whole of the UK, I concur with your view that that particular disaggregation would be unlikely, to say the least, because it does, uh, it, it, it does impinge upon the integrity of the single market. So if the UK had suggested, as we don't know whether it did or not, that this was a solution that applied to the whole of the UK, that would not have been acceptable, because, as I say, the integrity of the single market would be, would be affected. What we don't know, uh, and I wish I did know, was at what stage, if any, in the negotiations, the UK said, I don't think it ever did, but if it did say, look, there are separate issues here in Scotland too to which we require a particular approach. What read across could we have given the democratic imperative to have a compromise? We don't know whether they ever said that, but we do know that all the discussions that have taken place and, and been reported publicly in terms of attitude towards Scotland, particularly at the start of this process, and commented upon by UK government ministers, were that um, if the UK were to come to the table seeking special dispensations for Scotland or particular deals for Scotland, that would have become part of the negotiation because it would have been brought to the table by the UK. Now, I can't say whether or not that particular formulation that came out at the end would have been the same formulation exactly applied to Northern Ireland. What I can say is that no attempt appears to have been made to do the read across by the UK government and to recognise that the case, which is a different case, of course it's a different case, but the case for ensuring that Scotland had a better treatment because, A, of how it voted, and secondly, because of the implications <laughs> of competition from Northern Ireland, that that was the case. Now, if the, the UK government were to say, were to have said, because it's late in the day for this deal, were to have said that's what should have happened, certainly my view from what I have heard in, in the EU is that discussion would have taken place because it would have been part of the negotiations. If it had been pursued with vigour by the UK government, in the same way as they were absolutely insistent that there had to be a deal for Northern Ireland, then I'm sure there would have been some different treatment. Okay. The, the reality was nothing was done. Okay. So my, That's where we are. So just to be clear about this, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I do think that it's very important that we clarify this for the record. Um, uh, my question was, what evidence do you have that the, that the solution proposed by the First Minister, for completely understandable reasons, given everything that you've written in your various Scotland place, Scotland's Place in Europe, documents, that the solution, what evidence do you have that the solution proposed by the First Minister would be acceptable to the European Union? And your answer is you don't have any evidence no, that it would I, be that acceptable is, to the uh, European I, Union. I know you're not trying to put it words in my mouth, so I want to be absolutely clear what I say. We have, there is no evidence that at any stage the UK endeavoured to get a differentiated deal for Scotland. Therefore, where we find ourselves is a differentiated deal for Northern Ireland 
but an expression that such a deal was impossible for Scotland. That is not the case. A differentiated deal would have been possible for Scotland. What we are now left with, where there is one differentiated deal, is to say, uh, if there is only one differentiated deal on the table, we should have had it too. Uh, but do, do, do you not accept that the Euro European Union have accepted um, that there needs to be a differentiated deal for Northern Ireland to the extent that it compromises the integrity of the four fundamental freedoms only because of what the protocol describes as the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, which are not shared no. um, but, by any part of Great Britain. But, but, but we could have, and the UK government could have, and I, I'm not trying to be difficult about this, the UK government could have said at any stage, here are the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland and the unique circumstances in Scotland, which are not the same, absolutely not the same, but they both require for us, speaking as the UK government, to have an understanding of that in the negotiations and to produce an outcome that is acceptable. That did not happen. So when you're at the end of that process and you have on the table one unique deal, it is entirely legitimate to say we should have that deal too. Thank you. Tom, we're moving into the future. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you described perhaps some of the reaction to the withdrawal agreement as a false dawn. I think it would also be fair to say that this is not the end, the beginning of the end, and given the arithmetic of the House of Commons, probably not even the end of the beginning. But if you will indulge me for a moment in the hypothetical that the withdrawal agreement does find a majority in the House of Commons, and we move into the post 29th of March world. The negotiations that the United Kingdom will have to undertake with the European Union will be the most difficult negotiations the UK has had to conduct in the post-war era. The UK, a state which has not had an independent trade policy in almost half a century, will be going up against a trading superpower. There's clearly a great asymmetry of power in this scenario. However, this is further compounded by the arrangements um, that are made, uh, provisions are made for within the withdrawal agreement. With reference to the withdrawal agreement and the lack of any unilateral options for the UK, can you perhaps characterise uh, the context that the UK will have to conduct these negotiations in and what you think some of the implications would be with regards to the concessions that the European Union will be able to extract on numerous areas, for example, fishing? Well, um, I, I, I had a, a fascinating conversation with a Swiss negotiator um, some time ago who said to me, you know, the UK should remember that they're, you know, if they're going to negotiate with you, they're negotiating with the best in the world. Uh, and you know, what we've actually seen is, is some, I think, fairness and generosity from the, the EU, but a recognition that if the UK sets its red lines, then that's in the end what's going to dictate what comes out. If the UK had gone in in a better frame of mind and gone in better prepared and better uh, uh, briefed, um, and with a, a better set of red lines, for example, looking at single market and customs union membership, it could have come out with those things. What will be necessary in these negotiations is absolute clarity of what the UK wants and how it can get it. You know, one of the remarkable things of the last two and a bit years is that what the UK wanted was only written down eventually uh, in the Chequers Agreement. We'd had actually uh, two years from the referendum to the Chequers Agreement without anything written down. Now, why was that? Because we now know, having seen what happened after the Chequers Agreement, when it was written down, people fell out over it and couldn't agree and resigned because of what's in it. And that's happened again with a written agreement. Now, last week, more people resigned. So the more specific the UK has become, the less able it has been able to keep its own people on board and the more it actually has been the victim of others. I think we'll see that during these very complicated negotiations, regrettably. I mean, I have little confidence that they will produce the results that are much vaunted. But remember, this takes a long time, and people's memories are often short. And we see what we're seeing at the present moment, that people say, a plague on all your houses. We've had enough of all this. We just wanted to stop. Our obligation, I would suggest, is to persist, to tell people the truth of it as we see it, and to try and ameliorate the the difficulties and disasters if we can and that's what we're going on trying to do and this also things keep changing minute by minute i mean i've just been told that this morning on radio and amber rudd says it is my view parliament will stop no deal now she said that on radio four this morning she has in a sense torpedoed the prime minister's argument it's either her deal or no deal so that gives an opportunity to say let's get this as right as we can given the chaos 
uh, and that would allow us to reject that deal and to do something better. If we were to choose the single market and customs union option, of course, then the type of negotiations you're talking about wouldn't be necessary. You spoke about the generosity and charity of the European Union in these negotiations. However, when it comes to deciding upon a free trade arrangement with the United Kingdom, ultimately it will be a, a transactional consideration. Now, as provisions within the withdrawal agreement effectively state that the UK is locked in a customs union or a shared customs area with the European Union until such times as Brussels determines otherwise, does this not make it impossible, therefore, without an agreement with Europe, for the UK to cut any independent trade deals with third countries? Well, I mean, they may cut them, but they'll be a, at a great disadvantage in so doing, and we know that. I mean, there's no mm. pot of gold. I've said this, I think, every time I've been on this committee. There is no pot of gold in, in these new trade negotiations. It simply does not exist. Mm -hmm. And it's a cruel deception to people to say it does exist. Any deals that will be struck will be disadvantageous and minor. I noticed, I noticed that last weekend, while all the fuss was going on in London, that um, uh, David Davis and the uh, former um, uh, a, a agriculture secretary, whose name escapes me, to Owen Patterson, indeed, were in Oklahoma or discussing trade matters with the Trade Commission from Oklahoma. Mm. You know, and apparently there are huge trading opportunities in Oklahoma. Uh, what they failed to notice. The actual fact uh, that there are two European countries higher up in the amount of trade they do with Oklahoma than ourselves, uh, but both Germany and the Netherlands. So there's no barriers, if you wish to trade to Oklahoma, to do so now. The fact that it's not being done is probably a reflection of how poor the UK has been in setting up these agreements. But Oklahoma is 0.3% of the trade potential of the United States. So this is all nonsensical. Can I make a point about, I think, the three big issues in here? One is... The integrity of the single market will be very important to the EU, and that will dominate the next process. It will be absolutely determined not to, to weaken that. Secondly, the UK will be as a third country. We treat it like a third country. So it won't have any heft or weight in negotiations which it has as a member of the EU. And thirdly, we are not the centre of the universe. British exceptionalism has been a real problem within these negotiations. And the reality of the situation is uh, there are bigger fish to fry in the EU at the present moment. And therefore, this will fall rapidly down the agenda of, of an EU which has major issues of its own to address. If I could very finally, Cabinet Secretary, ask about with regard to timescales. Do you think the timescales set out within the withdrawal agreement are realistic, given that an average EU trade deal takes about four years plus a lengthy implementation They're impossible. period? They're utterly impossible. The European elections take place in June, so you can't expect uh, anything much to happen between March and June, nothing at all. Then a new commission comes in. I think the expectations is it will be hard to form that commission, uh, given the likely outcome of the elections, which will not be clear cut. So you could October is normally about the earliest to expect a commission to be in place. It could be the end of the year. What does that leave? Twelve months. Well, to, and, and I mean you just you can't do this in twelve months. So when Barnier says we'll give you till the end of 2022, and Tory Brexiteers throw their hands up in horror and shout about vassal states, uh, they'll be lucky that 2022 is the conclusion, given the complexity of it. You stated October, that would give nine months before the decision has to be it's made. Just, on it, but it, it would give nine months before having to make a decision on extending a transition period. So do you think it's inevitable the transition period would have I, to be extended? It's impossible to do it in the time required. There was, apparently, the end of the transition period. The date was to be written to the withdrawal implementation bill. Hmm. I'd be highly surprised if that happens now. So. Willie, do you, have any, do you still want to ask that question? If I could, uh, yeah. Bruce, yeah. if there's okay. time. Thanks very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I just wanted to ask a wee question about the digital single market. Um, the Prime Minister's on record saying we're coming out of that as well. Uh, as you probably know, the digital single market's worth about 400 billion euros per year and supports hundreds of thousands of jobs right across the European Union. And in the half an hour or so we've been here, I've searched the document. You don't have to read it cover to cover, but there's only four mentions of the word digital in it. And they're about um, digitally signing application forms for residency. So there's not a word in the entire document about this massive, massive uh, digital economy in Europe. What's the Scottish Government's view about this? And how can we possibly take this forward to ensure that Scotland's interests are maintained in this economy? Uh, we, we've addressed this uh, in, in previous publications. It's not just a question, when you leave this whole process of leaving the EU, it's not just 
walking away from things that are valuable. It is also foregoing opportunities that would continue to be valuable. And the digital single market is a classic example of foregoing opportunities. You know, Edinburgh's a very good example. I declare an interest, you know, I'm, you know I, 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 my son is involved in the tech center, it's a sector in Edinburgh. Edinburgh's got a flourishing tech sector. You know, it, 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 the, the opportunities for Edinburgh and for Scotland in the digital single market are enormous, but they are immensely diminished because we will not be in it as a member. We'll be in it as a third country, and third countries, by definition, do not get the privileges of membership. So this is really a crying shame for the opportunity that exists in Edinburgh, in, in, throughout the, the, the UK. These are opportunities that will not be taken. And these are the opportunities of you know, the next decade of the 21st century. These are the things which we would need to do. Now, we will no doubt be able to do some of them, but one hand will be tied behind our back. Well, why should we do that? Why should we? We not, wouldn't vote to do that. We don't want to do that. It's the wrong thing for us, but it's being imposed upon us. And that is utterly wrong. OK, okay I don't see any other member wishing to ask any more questions. So uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his evidence this morning. Uh, the co committee previously agreed to take the next item in private, so I now close this public part of the meeting. <laughs>